Oh, so fun. You have such a nice radio voice. This episode of the Jack Tomczak Show is brought to you by Scott Schulte and High 10 Service in Coon Rapids. Visit high10service.com to schedule your vehicle's appointment. That's high10service.com. It's the Jack Tomczak Show. Welcome back to the Jack Tomczak Show. We say goodbye to Pete Orput. Now joining us in studio is Courtney Daniel, who is she's just a friend of mine. Yeah. From a million years ago. Um, million. Former Jim Ramstead intern. Yep. Um, how you been? Good, good. How are you? I'm doing, I, well, I can't complain. Awesome. Um, so since the last time I saw you, you've gotten breast cancer and defeated it. Yes. Um, and you're going to talk today about uh, breast cancer awareness. Did you bring a pink ribbon for me? No. Why not? Yes. I don't like pink. Okay. <laughs> Used to be my favorite color. Now, not so much. So, uh... I think I saw on Facebook that uh, you, as a breast cancer survivor, are not a fan of the the pink ribbon breast cancer awareness movement. Um, why? Um, you know, I don't know if it's so much like the pink ribbon necessarily, because I think that um, awareness for early detection and everything like that has been super important for okay. women. Um, early detection is essentially the key to stopping the disease early. Okay. And making sure that women do get, um, you know, the treatment that they need. Oh, and October is Breast Cancer Awareness it Month, is. which is why we're talking about it. Yes. I mean, you probably talk about it all the time. Yeah. But the rest of us, we only get one month. Yeah. This yeah. is this is a good time to talk about it. Um, pink in general, though, now has um, come to be more related to a term in the breast cancer community of pink washing. And what that is referring to is more of the businesses or um, companies or even, you know, fake kind of businesses that spring up during this time of year okay. to, um, you know, perpetuate sales for product or other things that then actually in turn don't um, generate funds back into a reputable breast cancer charity or, um, you know, disease prevention, you know, all of the things mm -hmm. that they say they're going to be doing with the money that they are collecting yep. from sales of different items. So the, that term pink washing is what we now use to describe sort of that phenomenon that has grown out of, yes, pink ribbons initially were meant to bring awareness to early detection um, of breast cancer and all of those screenings, mammography, uh, ultrasound, uh, biopsy, if it comes to it. Um, but, you know, as time went on, People caught on that mm -hmm. they could, hey, I'm going to sell this pink T-shirt or I'm going to sell this pink mug and some of the money is going to go back to breast cancer. Well, what charity is it going to go back to? Mm -hmm. How are they going to use the funds? Um, you know, how is that going to do anything to, you know, improve early detection or screening if that's what they said they're going to be doing with the mm -hmm. money? And is any of that money going back to research and development of cure? Like I could start an Internet store selling T-shirts or whatever, flip-flops. That that claim to be uh, like any some of the money or all the money that you you spend buying this pink stuff is going to go to breast cancer research and that might not be true exactly and those things are happening exactly right. everywhere and so you know it, it it's unfortunate because it puts it on like the every person who first of all I was the every person before mm -hmm. I was diagnosed I thought breast cancer was a single disease it's breast cancer that's all it is that's what I think now yeah and well, it's not it's a you've group got 20 minutes to clarify yeah that. it's a group of a lot of diseases and unfortunately it means different types of treatments and it means that there are going to be different cures for different subtypes of the actual disease of breast cancer okay. and in order to find those things you know research and development needs to be done to you know create different avenues of treatment for all of those different diseases. Mm -hmm. And when money is being taken and pocketed by businesses, um, when, you know, well-meaning everyman citizens yep. think I'm giving some money to breast cancer because I'm buying this pink crap. And then it really doesn't go where you think it's going to be going. You know, that's where we have that issue. And where it becomes sort of one of those things where it's like an icky pink month, quote unquote, for a lot of us, right. you know, it's just gross and it's not fun anymore mm -hmm. where it used to be, you know, that, yeah, it, it meant something. It was nice. You know, it was lighter, but the disease itself is really ugly mm -hmm. and it doesn't, I don't know. I mean, I just think really people, people need to be a little bit more conscientious about where their money is going. Has has October being Breast Cancer Awareness Month and the the whole pink movement has that made 
has that made pe- more people pay attention to breast cancer, or has that made is that taking like the seriousness out of breast cancer? Um, I think it can go both ways. Okay. I certainly think that, um, at least in my circle, there are people that are more interested now in, you know, where their money would be going, how they can support the right charities, what the right charities might be, mm-hmm. um, how to find those charities, that kind of thing. But yeah, I mean, definitely, I think there still is, you know, you go into a store and there's, you know, the ugly pink t-shirt with the ugly pink ribbon on it and all this. Yeah, it's all going to go to breast cancer research or breast cancer early detection or whatever and it's not going anywhere except in the retailer's pocket. <laughs> when I see things, and I, I think this comes from like you knowing a lot about breast cancer, mm-hmm. and you know knowing a lot about uh, the research and the money and all that stuff, like that that's your area of expertise, uh, one of them. Um, whenever I see groups pop up to raise money in politics, I'm like, hang on, that's not that's not the right thing. Right. We shouldn't be doing that. It's the like, same that, thing. Don't put money into that. That's mm-hmm. that's not the right. That's not that doesn't help. We yeah. should do we should do this thing over here. That's the right answer. So stop. Stop putting money into that, and people who are raising money for that, stop doing that because you're you're doing more harm than good. Mm-hmm. So there, it's that. Yeah, yeah. I mean that would totally equate. Yeah, it's the same kind of thing. Like everybody should just listen to me mm-hmm. and do what I want to yep. do. Yeah, and I mean you could even look at it as the two, um, you know, two different parties. If you're going to go right and left, and you know you want money to go somewhere because you support this side or that side, it's the same thing in um, sort of research and development into a cure, and early detection Mm -hmm. because there's two different avenues of how money and breast cancer research can be used, you know? So in my, you know, grand viewpoint of the whole thing, I don't give a crap where the money's going to go on which side, Mm -hmm. but I want the money to go to one of the sides because those are the things that are doing good things, you know, on either side of the disease. Now people would say, like if I start, uh, Jack's Breast Cancer Awareness Pink T-shirt website and start selling T-shirts and taking mm-hmm. all the money for myself, I, I could at least argue that, well, I'm raising awareness. For what? For, for breast cancer. How? By, by having people buy T-shirts. Mm-hmm. What do your T-shirts say? Uh, they're just pink and they have a ribbon on them. And they say, be aware of breast cancer. Mm-hmm. But what does that really mean? You know, uh-huh. that's the thing. Like, that's kind of what the fallback now has been yeah. or the argument for, oh, I, it's okay that I'm doing it, you know, because I'm raising awareness. Well, who's not aware? Everyone's aware that the disease exists. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It's now more, you know, get, being aware of how you can, um, you know, achieve early detection if it's necessary, what you need to know about it in terms of your family history. Um, you know, resources for someone who's just been diagnosed, Mm -hmm. uh, resources for someone who's diagnosed metastatic, which means that they will be stage four and die from the disease. You know, there are uh, lots of other things that deserve awareness Mm -hmm. besides the pink. So as a, as a guy, and I understand that breast cancer can get guys too, but Mm -hmm. it typically doesn't. Right. Right. Um, as a guy, my, my awareness of breast cancer is, is, is all the pink part of it. Okay. And uh, I found a you know, Facebook likes likes to remind people of the the bad jokes they made ten years ago. Yeah. And and this one was good. Um, the NFL was having uh, the guys, uh, the football players were wearing pink shoes or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I made the the comment that this is making it, it's football plus breasts, the two things that guys are already very aware of, <laughs> and and they're putting this. Like, what does this actually accomplish mm-hmm. by having the NFL as a partner, or whatever the heck that means? Mm-hmm. Um, cause people are, they're, they're aware now. And now as a guy, I'm aware that it exists and it's a problem, but I don't know what somebody's supposed to do. Does the, does the run of the mill regular woman out there, is she, is her level of awareness where mine is, or has it gotten to the point where women know what to look out for, what to do, where to go? Yeah, no, I think you're probably right in that, that, you know, unfortunately, it is still sort of like, yeah, women are aware that they should be getting mammogram, you know, starting at potentially age 30 to 35, depending on their family history, and some other type of screenings based on that as well. And then, you know, whatever their doctor suggests following that, if it's every two years, five years, one year, depending. Um, But that's about it. You know, self exams. Sure, that's been pushed. You know, people can do that in the shower once a month. You're just looking for anything that seems different, changes. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, until I was diagnosed, I had no idea that there were tons of other red flags in terms of your breast health that you can be looking for that would potentially signal an issue that would drive you into a doctor's office for some kind of 
you know, just follow up or exam. 100% of my listeners are women. Um, so take this opportunity. Like, yeah. what are those other things? Sure. So, you know, any changes in breast discharge, any changes in the skin itself around your breast or nipple, any darkening of the skin, anything that makes the skin look like orange peel. Okay. Um, it's, you know, just one of the signs of a certain type of breast cancer. And then any kind of like puckering, dimpling, inversion of the nipple, anything that would change like the actual, you know, normal topography of your breast. (laughs) You know, you're kind of looking at that and you're like, that doesn't seem right. Um, You know, soreness and things like that, pain, those can be some um, things that may be concerning, but aren't always a a sign of something else going on. Then, of course, you're looking for anything that's typical that they tell you about Mm -hmm. lumps, bumps, changes that way that you can feel on a once a month breast exam. It's a good idea to do breast exam in the shower. Um, you're usually relaxed. It's, you know, warm, that kind of thing. Put your arm over your head on the one side, use the opposite hand to feel the breast. Um, you know, nipple outward is what you want to do in a circular all the way around the breast. And then you just switch sides. You want to go up into your armpit as well. Cause anything like, um, sore areas in your armpit, sore areas up in your neck that can potentially be, um, you know, lymph nodes swollen, that kind of thing. Um, sure. That can come with any kind of virus too. So don't scare yourself. You know, you can get swollen lymph nodes with a virus. Um, But certainly if you have something that kind of stays and it's not going away after two, three, four weeks, Mm -hmm. you're going to want to get that checked out. And that's a good idea. It's a good thing if you go to the doctor saying, I've got found this. And the doctor says, well, it's not breast cancer. It's something else. That's a good day. Yes, exactly. All right. Let's take a break. And when we come back, I want to find out. uh, We're talking about uh, October being Breast Cancer Awareness Month and, and what that means and what that should mean. Uh, talking with Courtney Daniel, breast cancer survivor. When we come back, I want to find out your story and what you've done since then uh, with that. All that and more when we return to listening to the Jack Tomzak Show on AM 1280, The Patriot. Ad break. If you haven't joined my Patreon yet, you are missing out. I'm giving away trinkets to all my supporters. If you want a trinket with my name on it, go to jacktomzak.com. That's Tomzak spelled the super confusing way. Welcome back to the Jack Tomzak Show on AM 1280, The Patriot. I'm talking with Courtney Daniel. Uh, former Jim Stad, Jim Ramstead intern and breast cancer survivor. Um, we talked about how October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and it's also the month where anybody wants to make a buck and sell something with the word breast, and that's pink, and they will make some money. True story. So should, people aren't going to do their own research. No. Like, uh, people are too busy, and they, they want to yeah, be helpful, course. so they buy the pink thing. They think they've done it. Um, where should people, if they want to give money to breast cancer causes, where should they give it? Sure. So, I mean, number one um, is a cure. And so looking at, uh, you know, different charities and groups that, uh, you know, raise money for research and development and give 100% of their funds towards that cause, uh, Metaviver is the number one charity for metastatic breast cancer research and development uh, into a cure for the disease itself, all subtypes. So that is the number one place people should be donating. Um, number two, you're going to want to look at maybe something like local, if that means something to you. Okay. In the area here in the Twin Cities, there are definitely quite a few great charities that work with families and provide financial grants and other services. Um, there is uh, Firefly Sisterhood, which sets women up with someone of the same subtype of breast cancer as themselves as a mentor during the initial stages of their disease diagnosis and treatment process. It's a great way to you know learn a little bit more about your specific subtype and what someone else who's approximately the same age as you, maybe same socioeconomic background, you know, maybe um, even same area of the cities. So potentially doctors could be the same, that kind of thing. Um, That really helps um, women kind of feel comfortable. How terrifying is it to learn you have breast cancer and how important is it to find somebody who can, who's been through it and can help? Yeah, you know, I think especially, you know, I was 40, 41 when I was diagnosed. I didn't have a lot of friends that had gone through it. So this it's pretty recent. hard. Yeah. Yeah. It was three years, less than three years ago. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's pretty hard because you're like, what am I going to do? Oh, this is crazy. Like nobody has this yet, mm-hmm. you know, quote unquote, you're thinking this is a old people's disease or it happens to, Other people. you know, someone's grandparent or whatever. And 
No, it's crazy. I mean, there are so many women and and going through it, I realize there are so many women who are very young who end up getting diagnosed. And so, yeah, something like Firefly Sisterhood, where you have that connection without having to go into your own social network, um, it's, it's really nice. So that's helpful. And again, because I had said, and you're like, oh, breast cancer is one disease. Yeah, it's, it's one disease, but it's, it's an umbrella. And underneath are all of these different little subtypes of the disease that bring different nuances to each person's treatment program and that kind of thing. So I assume that treatment has, has evolved over the course of time. Are they any closer to curing breast cancer? Um, I think they're making progress, and unfortunately, it's going to be by subtype. Yeah. Um, the subtype that I was diagnosed with, HER2 positive, estrogen, progesterone negative. So my breast cancer was driven by the HER2 um, factor uh, and not by estrogen or progesterone, which is the most common, is a hormone positive. Breast cancer is the most common type of breast cancer. And um, that one itself is a little bit... is become sort of like top of the the table for you know developing cure okay. and that's because they've been able to pinpoint uh the mechanism that's driving that particular subtype of cancer and so they're able to create treatment specifically to you know dismantle that mechanism in at the cell level and okay. you know stop the proliferation of the disease itself So, I mean, I think there's advances. It's there's great stuff coming out, but unfortunately it's going to go subtype by subtype. So it's got to be scary to get this diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And, um, at any, like, what what was your reaction? Like, was there a thought of what was there? Um, this is it for me. Oh yeah. It was a disaster. I was like, I'm going to die. This is terrible. I'm going to die. I'm going to leave these poor children with my husband who's totally incapable of, like, getting them anywhere. Totally incapable. Make, making doctor's appointments, driving them to school. You know, I was like, oh, God, life is over. Everyone's going to die. Um, no. I mean, you know, if he had to, he could do it. But, I mean, that's – it's a scary thought because mm-hmm. you're like, I'm a stay-at-home mom to four kids. And, you know, this is what I do. And these are these little people that I take care of that depend on me. And now what am I going to do? Mm-hmm. Um but, I mean, there is something to be said for people that kind of have that huge emotional reaction in the beginning yeah. and their ability to kind of, you know, use that to then move forward, pick themselves up, dust themselves off, and move on with a better attitude about it, um, you know, later in treatment and then post-treatment. And there have been, you know, studies done on people's, you know, psychological mindset. Mm -hmm. And that if you start off kind of, it's not a problem, I'm great, I'm going to, you know, do awesome and that kind of thing, that you don't always have the best outcome in the end in terms of your mental health because you haven't kind of gone through that sort of grieving process with your diagnosis. And so, I mean, I think I thought I was a goner, (laughs) you know, at the beginning and, and it ended up working out pretty well for me because I became more rational, more informed as I like moved on through the process uh-huh. and um, feel much better about my prognosis and, and long-term prognosis now. So I don't understand cancer. Yeah. Um, I see people like Norm Coleman had stage four throat cancer yes. and he's alive. Yes. And there are people who, who have cancer, they beat it. And then you see a news story that the cancers return and then yes. they're dead in a week. Yes. Like, I don't understand how, how cancer works. And like, are you out of the woods? Yeah, so they're all different. So with breast cancer, the um, you know one in eight women will be diagnosed wow. with a breast cancer. Um, three of those eight will be diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer. Okay. Metastatic breast cancer is stage four breast cancer. Stage four breast cancer is an incurable disease. It is a terminal diagnosis. That does not mean that women are going to die within a month or two months or three months, but it does mean that 100% of women diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer will die from metastatic breast cancer. Wow. Um, so, I mean, you know, it's 30%. of women diagnosed with a curable stage breast cancer will recur as metastatic and die from the disease. So uh, there isn't a lot of, you know, it kind of doesn't matter. It picks and it doesn't pick and choose, you know, in like a specific, you know, way. So like if you were stage 3B, which is a 
you know, pretty significant amount of disease in your body at a curable okay. stage that you're definitely going to end up metastatic or you're definitely going to be cured by doing all of this stuff. Or if you were 1A, which is what I was, which is, you know, right at the beginning of the disease progression, a uh, very small amount of disease and, you know, still went through all the same treatment, you definitely are cured. You definitely won't have a recurrence. I mean, it's not a fact. My doctor used to say if there were 100 Courtney Daniels that came into my office, you know, seven of them are going to come back and tell me that they have metastatic breast cancer at some point oh. in their life. So, and he said, I just hope you're one of those 93 Courtney Daniels that won't. Jeez. You know, so, uh, I mean, it's one of those things where it's, you know, great. I feel pretty good about my odds. That that's a really good percentage mm -hmm. after going through the treatments that I chose to do. But at the same point, uh, we're going to pick know. this up in the podcast world. So if you're listening to this on the radio, uh, find the podcast at jacktomzak.com to listen to the rest of the conversation. Thank you for listening, Courtney. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. And uh, be here next week. All right, now we're in podcast land where you can say whatever you want. You can swear if you want to. Oh, um, great. So you're a fitness competitor now. I am. Was this post-breast cancer? Was this something you were doing before that? And how did getting a cancer diagnosis affect that? Because a lot of people would have been beaten psychologically and going to the gym all the time is hard as it is and and doing it enough where you can compete is even harder so how did that how did the breast cancer affect the the fitness competition stuff sure so competing actually is the reason i found my breast cancer okay so um, I do bikini fitness, which is the smallest um, body size kind of physique in the um, bodybuilding world. Okay. So um, we get down to a pretty low body weight, and I was at a competition. You wear beautiful sparkly bikini, and uh, they're quite uncomfortable in terms of how tightly you have to have them tied. And so in between... Uh, Pre-judging, which is the morning show where the judges take an initial look at you and finals, which is the evening show where they go ahead and award, you know, winners their prizes. Um, I went back to the hotel with my husband. I said, can you please take this off me and put my hands up over my chest so he could undo my bikini top and I could hold my chest. And when he took it down, I felt something in between my palm and my breast and thought, what the hell? And I said, get over here, come feel this. And he was like, uh, <laughs> and we sat down and we sat in silence for like 20 minutes. And I was like, I think I better call the doctor. And he's like, yeah, I think you better. Is it when you find something? Yeah. Is it big? Is it hard? Like, it, yeah, it's like so. This was different than anything else I'd ever felt. So, um, I've had four kids, uh, breastfed uh, or exclusively pumped for all of them, okay. and um, definitely have had a lot of breast changes and that kind of thing. A lot of women will understand and know that. Um, so that you know, sort of from mastitis to like cyst to that kind of thing, they all have sort of a different feeling. This was an interesting feeling. It was a little more like it was um, very small. It was okay. like pea-sized, it felt like to me. Um, it had sort of a, you know, a harder texture. And then it almost felt like anchored, okay. which is unfortunately what they say a breast cancer will feel like because it's sort of tied in okay. to the rest of the, you know, the body inside as opposed to like a cyst, which is fluid filled and softer and will be more mobile and that okay. kind of thing. So it definitely had a different feeling. Mm -hmm. So that must have messed up your, uh, well, everything in your life. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it did. I mean, it took a toll on the competing. I definitely took a break, um, ate a lot <laughs> and didn't do so great on my macros and tracking my nutrition. So this is less to do with how well maybe it doesn't but how one how one defeats breast cancer but and maybe more with how one uh, competes in fitness competitions uh to ha to be diagnosed with cancer is a huge yeah. blow in your life yeah and like but you're you're back at it yeah and that's amazing cuz a lot of people get get beaten yeah Even if they live they get beaten yeah so i i'll say i didn't ever give up during Everything. I mean, I'd go to chemo on Fridays and I'd go see my coach on, on Tuesday mornings, you know, that kind of thing. So it was, you know, I didn't really give up that way, but I certainly gave up, you know, a piece of, you know, that lifestyle, which is definitely the nutrition and making sure that you're keeping yourself healthy that way. I was just making any choice because 
you know, like I had mentioned before, I kind of went down the rabbit hole mm-hmm. initially and was like, I'm going to die. Yeah. And so if I'm going to die, I'm going to eat everything I possibly can. That's because why I live my life every day like that. <laughs> because I get hit by a bus. I'm going to eat this pizza. Everything's delicious, right? Yeah. So, yeah. But I certainly kept up um, being active and healthy. And that was important, too. I think it helped me get through chemo and, um, and radiation, definitely help keep me a little bit stronger. I was certainly tired from all of those treatments, but, um, you know, all of my doctors and everything, they were super supportive, um, about me continuing with the fitness and lifting and doing what I thought was comfortable after every surgery, you know, making sure that I was doing well enough to get back into the gym as quickly as I possibly could. And, you know, the thing is, is if you got a doctor that's saying you got to sit home and like, lay there and do nothing and Mm. you shouldn't be working out or you shouldn't be find a different doctor because you don't need that. I tell you, I have one of the best oncologists in the twin cities, like one of the best. And that was something that never would have come out of his mouth. Keep doing it. He said, keep working out. He said, so the, uh, what was the kind that, that comes back and, and metastatic breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, if you've got, if you've been diagnosed with cancer and mm-hmm. you've, you've, you've beaten it or mm-hmm. the first round, I don't know if sure. that's even what you call it. Um, you're pretty aware. Yep. And like, how does <clears> it, <throat> if it comes back as metastatic, can you can you catch it early on that? Because you've got to think you're paying attention. Yeah. No, more I than mean, the regular person is. Yeah, point. and I am. And there, with me personally, there's some other things. I had a PET scan early on in my um, diagnosis and ended up with a thyroid tumor as well, not related to the breast cancer, but and actually, like 73 percent of women will have some kind of a thyroid growth tumor, cyst, whatever. Okay. They don't even know it. You usually don't even know it. Okay. Um, I only knew it because I had the PET scan and it showed up. Okay. I never would have found out about it otherwise. It wasn't something that protruded or that they would have seen or noticed it wasn't even palpable actually but it was quite large right. it was sort of on the back side of my thyroid so I had that out and so I'm followed by an endocrinologist now too so I <laughs> unfortunately end up with one of these you know catch 22s where I'm getting a lot of blood work done which is great mm-hmm. because I could catch something yep. early um but it also kind of drives me nuts sure because I'll get something done and it's like I had a Tylenol so I get crazy liver enzymes back right sure. and then I'm like oh god I have <laughs> I have cancer in my liver. No, no, no. So, you know, it's one of those things where I think, um, no, there, you know, to long answer to your question, no, there kind of really isn't any way to catch metastatic early because no matter what, metastatic means you're stage four and you will not be cured of breast cancer at this point in time. Mm. Hopefully that changes in the future and there will be stage four cures, but at this point in time, that's what that means. And so, you know, Uh, going through a lot of extra when you're cured or you were cured of stage and you have finished treatment and you're no evidence of disease, there is no more cancer in your body that they can see on your final screenings. It doesn't make a lot of sense to be putting people's bodies through additional screenings that they don't need. Now, if someone has breast tissue left, they definitely need breast screenings still. Um, I do not. I had a double mastectomy. I have no breast tissue, so I do not get any kind of breast screenings at all. Someone who gets a lumpectomy or single mastectomy will have continued breast screenings. Um, And that can be a combination of things like mammogram or MRI. Um, But what they don't want to do is put people's bodies through a lot of additional radiation, screenings, and that kind of thing. Because those actual tests can also potentially lead to damage down the road. Secondary cancers, um, you know, other things that can be complications to a lot of MRI or a lot of, you know, PET, CT, and that kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean, they really don't. You really have to just be aware of your body. And if you feel like you have an issue, it's lasting two, three, four weeks, you need to make an appointment, go in and get it checked out. So Kaylee McEnany, Trump's former uh, press secretary. Okay. uh, She got a preemptive double mastectomy. Yes. And I think Angelina Jolie did that too. Yes, my girlfriend Tammy did too, even before Angelina Jolie did it. Um, and uh, it's Kaylee woman, like she's got eight people in her family who got breast cancer. Yes. So like, because I, I read that and it, it's in the news because I don't know if you're aware of this, but October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So I saw that. And I'm like, that seems like a, that's a big step. It is. 
but I guess with eight people in your family? Yep, yep. Uh, women who t- tend to choose that um, avenue are known as the term called a previvor. Okay. So before they would actually have to be a survivor, they preemptively have surgery and are a previvor. Um, what they choose to do is after getting um, probably a lot of uh, genetic counseling, mm-hmm. uh, genetic testing, and also probably some um, therapy with, you know, a, a reputable, you know, therapist or something else, who someone who deals specifically with people who have breast cancer history, right. breast cancer in the family, will make the choice to have their breasts removed in order to avoid the potential for any kind of disease progression. Uh, Some of those women also then have children, and after having children choose to have an oophorectomy or an an oophorectomy where they have their um, ovaries removed or have a full hysterectomy and have their uterus removed as well. Um, unfortunately, uh, the type of cancer that a lot of people end up having on screening in their history or the potential to get, so having a positive um, BRCA1 or 2 gene um, in your DNA, in your family history, um, they come hand in hand with some other um, things like cervical cancer, uh, uterine cancer that kind of thing. So not only would it be the potential for breast cancer, but it would be the potential for other cancers in the women's reproductive system. Yikes. Yeah. Yeah, it's a huge thing. Um, it's a huge thing. And I think it's definitely something that's probably very a very hard decision because it's obviously young women making that decision before it would have progressed. Um, do women live in constant awareness of all of their cancer possibilities no i don't because men don't no i don't think so at all no and i mean that was one of the reasons why the genetic testing done so i was adopted i don't have a lot of um family medical history yeah and um i had that done because i was concerned about my boys Mm -hmm. and that certain breast cancers and a hereditary disposition for them uh, can also relate to the potential for prostate cancer. So I have boys. People are like, why are you getting all that done? You have boys. Who cares? Well, yeah, but if I have something, mm-hmm. it means that they have at, at a much higher risk for prostate cancer. So, Did a cancer diagnosis, apart from, of course, making you an advocate, uh, did it change you in other ways? Like big things tend to change people. Cancer's a big thing. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I think I decided to make my circle smaller. Why is that? Um, you know, I think it just was the right time to, you know, sort of take a look at who was going to show up and be mm-hmm. supportive and who was just there to get information about what was happening to me so they could tell the next person. Mm. And unfortunately, you know, that plays out during disease. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, it can show you who's really in your corner. Yeah. So. All right. Thanks, Courtney. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, This was fun talking about you having cancer. Yeah, yeah. Um, Good times. I appreciate (laughs) it. And uh, I'll put this up and you can share it with all your very small circle of friends now. Sounds awesome. Thanks. Okay. Ad break. I bet you thought I forgot about you. Go to jacktomzak.com and join my Patreon right now. I said right now.